Hello everyone and welcome to the first of our online talks for HipFest 2022, a string of pearls, mandarin ducks, butterflies and modern Shanghai in the 1920s with Dr. Victor Fan, supported by the Confucius Institute for Scotland in the University of Edinburgh. My name is Alison Strauss and I'm the director of HipFest with Falkirk Community Trust. This event is an exciting development for us on Team HipFest. In common with many, many others, before the pandemic, we'd never done any online programming, but we took the plunge in March last year to deliver HipFest in a digital format. And the process was challenging to say the least, but I'm very proud to say that we overcame the challenges. And, and HipFest 2021 has even won the recent Silent London poll for the best digital silent film festival of the year. Um, and we learned a lot from that edition, lots of technical stuff, obviously, but also we learned that whilst our audience, whilst we all feel strongly that going virtual is not a substitute for the live experience, there is actually lots to love about some kind of online offering. And so we've put together this wee package of talks and discussions in the run up to the festival. And we've thrown in a couple of live streams during the five days too. And um, thank you so much for encouraging us to go on this adventure together. And we hope you find these, these bonus elements interesting and enjoyable. Our speaker today is Dr. Victor Fan. And Victor is a reader in film and media philosophy at King's College London. He was film consultant of the Chinese Visual Festival from 2013 to 2021. He's the author of many books and articles on Chinese film published internationally, with his work appearing in journals including Camera Obscura, Journal of Chinese Cinemas, Screen and Film History. His forthcoming book, Cinema Illuminating Reality, Media Philosophy Through Buddhism, will be published in 2022 by the University of Minnesota Press. And I first had the pleasure of encountering Dr. Fan when he contributed to an online discussion for the Pordenone Silent Film Festival back in 2020. And not only is Victor an expert in Chinese cinema, but he is also a filmmaker, a performance artist, a classically trained musician, a working composer, and wonderfully for us, he's an excellent speaker too. I'd now like to invite Dr. Victor Fan to turn on your camera, please. And welcome, Victor. Thank you so much for joining us as our first speaker for HipFest this year. We're very much looking forward to your talk, so I'll just hand over to you right away. Thank you so much, Alison, um, for this generous um, introduction. And I'm, I feel extremely honored to be able to give this talk <clears throat> to a really, really wonderful film made in Shanghai in 1926 called A String of Pearls. And so I'm gonna share my screen and so that we will have some <clears throat> visual information. Um, a String of Pearls was, was actually made in 1926 and uh, in Shanghai. And we can see it as an example of the kind of modern cinema that a lot of Shanghai filmmakers and intellectuals in the 1920s had aspired to achieve. And this is a very specific kind of aspiration because um, by 1931, with the invasion of Shanghai and Manchuria by the Japanese military, a lot of these aspirations eventually began to change. And I will also talk a little bit about what kinds of changes we um, basically those filmmakers had um, suggested and eventually implemented. And it is also one of the few surviving films written by director Ho Yao, who was a pioneer in Chinese language film theory and criticism. So in this talk, I will introduce historical background and critical discourses of Shanghai cinema in relation to this masterpiece. Now, <clears throat> let me introduce to you um, director uh, Li Ziyuan a little bit. Li Ziyuan was actually um, um, <clears throat> a student in New York City 
And in 1920, he went to the cinema. I'm, I'm sure that he went to the cinema earlier than 1920. But in 1920, he saw a film in New York City, which um, he was really infuriated by the misrepresentation of Chinese characters in the film. As a matter of fact, at that time in Chinese language newspapers in the United States, as well as in Shanghai, there was a term for it. It was called Ru Hua Pian. Ru Hua Pian literally means films that humiliate China or Chinese characters. And as a result of that <clears throat> feeling, of humiliation. In 1921, he joined some other uh, US-based uh, Chinese students and also young professionals to form a film company called the Great War Film Company. And so in 1922, he made a few educational films, which really aimed to introduce um, aspects of Chinese cultures that could, um, for example, like Chinese costumes or Chinese martial arts and exercises in a way or in the hope that um, he could introduce um, the way um, Chinese uh, people in the, or Chinese Americans at that time perceived uh, Chinese culture as opposed to the more mainstream Orientalist approach. And in 1924, um, the Great War Film Company was finally registered in Shanghai, and he directed a really important film called uh, Qi Fu, or The Divorcee, and it was um, an adaptation of an American popular theater piece. And it was really a box office hit. And on the right lower corner of uh, the slide, uh, you will be able to see the poster of that particular film and also a production still from The Divorcee. Now, another really important person um, who worked on this film was screenwriter Hou Yao. Hou Yao actually went to the Nanking Normal School of Higher Education, which was then incorporated into the National Southeast University during the time of his enrollment between 1921 to 1925. And in 1925, he stayed with the university to teach literature and screenwriting. And so um, at that time, he also served as a screenwriter for Great War Film Company and wrote many films made by precisely uh, Li Zeyuan. And in 1926, however, he left the Great War Film Company and joined a much older and much more financially stable film company called China Sun Motion Picture Company and made a very important film called Si Xiang Ji or Romance of the West Chamber. And that film actually traveled around the world and became showcased in Europe and North America as a really spectacular film that, um, that featured um, Chinese architecture, um, medieval Chinese architecture, and also landscape. In 1933, he left Shanghai and went to Hong Kong and was hired by uh, Shaw Brothers South Sea Film Company. And, and part of the reason why he left Shanghai at that time was that um, a lot of great film companies in the 1920s um, started to make exclusively martial art films around 1925 to 1926. So if you were someone who really wanted to make something like a literary drama, something that um, has some kind of um, effective substance, um, you would try to seek employment somewhere. And so in 1940, he was sent by the Shaw brothers to Singapore to try to make films. And when he arrived at Singapore, he made a lot of anti-Japanese films. But as you can imagine, when the Japanese began to occupy Singapore, he was captured and then eventually tortured and executed by the Japanese military. Now, um, and at that, in the 1920s, the cinema in Shanghai featured a particular kind of uh, performance. 
And you can say that um, there were many production centers in China at that time, including Shanghai, uh, Canton, or nowadays we call Guangzhou, and Hong Kong as well. Um, and basically a lot of the filmmakers in these regions would consider the cinema as a kind of filmed theater. Now, for most playwrights and actors, the cinema was best seen as a new medium, where the xinju or the new theater, sometimes also known as the wenmingxi or civilized play, could be preserved, replayed, and disseminated to a wider audience. Now, these theatrical pieces were usually localized and abridged adaptations of Euro-American novels, staged dramas and films, as well as original plays that were based on sensational Shanghai news items. Now, these films usually employ a series of static long shots that emulate the proscenium, and actors would also form a semicircle on stage in order to perform to the camera and the audience in a kind of hybrid uh, style of representation and also presentation. And so as you can see in this particular picture, you can see that the four characters uh, are almost lining up. Um, they are not in so semicircle, but they're in one single line. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and they are literally performing to the audience um, as a uh, directly as a kind of presentation of the drama to the audience. Now, um, we too need to bear in mind that um, a lot of Shanghai filmmakers eventually in the 1930s, um, and also a lot of filmmakers elsewhere in Europe, America, um, in, uh, in the 1920s, 1930s, or even up until the 1970s, would regard this kind of film theater very primitive and also regressive. Um, but we do need to bear in mind that that wasn't uh, entirely unique to Shanghai. Um, for example, certain um, modes of Russian cinema before the revolution, and also even like Italian cinema, um, they also had a very similar kind of tendency to treat the cinema as a kind of filmed theater. But um, as you can imagine, in the 1920s, um, um, a lot of Euro-American, Soviet, and Japanese filmmakers tried to break away from the theater in order to strive for cinema's medium specificity. And so Chinese filmmakers and intellectuals were thinking along the same line at the same time. So for example, for screenwriter Gu Kenfu and also Hou Yao, who was the screenwriter of, the, of this film, um, they wrote substantially about the cinema, and for them, the theatricality, sensationalism, and sentimentality of the new theater, the filmed theater that I've just introduced, was conceded unsophisticated and, or, and even immoral, because a lot of those films featured, as I said, like sensational news items, which often in, um, involved sex workers and uh, divorces and a lot of these issues. And so in a magazine called Ying Si Da Zhi, or Motion Picture Review, um, and Gu Ken Fu um, actually wrote um, that uh, it's really important for um, that cinema medium specificity is what he calls xi ju or play hyphen drama. So it's a play and also a drama, which is actually staged in reality. And he also considers the cinema um, is not just a uh, filmed theater, but also uh, by preserving a performance in reality, but performing the drama itself in reality, it is also a pre preservation of that reality in real time. And so Gu Ken Fu um, and other writers also raise further awareness of the Ru uh, Hua Pian or the films that insult China. Um, and so, and also raise awareness of Hollywood, Hollywood's misrepresentation of Chinese characters and China in general. Hou Yao was also very, uh, uh, 
prolific writer at that time. And so um, in 1925, in order to teach screenwriting, he wrote a screenwriting manual called Method of Writing a Screenplay for the Shadow Play or for the Cinema. And um, he argues that the cinema should perform the function of inculcating its national audience with moral values. Um, it should also educate its international audience. So he's not only aiming for the audience in China, but also beyond that, um, to educate its international audience how people in China wanted themselves to be represented. And for Hou Yao, very much like Gu Kenfu, the cinema captures reality. But beyond that, the cinema captures what he calls the phenomena of life, uh, or ren sheng, the xian uh, xiang. And so you can see it as a way to capture life in itself. So by watching these films, you can begin to delve into the depth of what it means to be alive, what it means to be human. Um, <clears throat> and so for him, the cinema should elevate itself from a pure popular entertainment to, um, to almost the level of literature. And the way of doing it is by adaptation. Now, um, another group of intellectuals which are very worthwhile to be mentioned would be called the uh, Yuan Yang Hu Die Pai, or Mandarin Ducks and Blood Butterfly, sorry, Butterfly School. And um, Bao Tian Xiao and Zhang Henshui are the two major authors that were uh, very active at that time. And so the idea is that um, these butterfly and Mandarin ducks authors believed that the cinema should really uh, elevate itself by adapting stories from literature. Um, and, and they created their own literary works and very much um, they, you could consider them as popular novels or short stories or sometimes even novellas. Um, other times they would, um, other times they would adapt European and American novels, but the way they adapt European and American novels are not um, a direct adaptation. So they rarely simply just take the entire novel and, and translate them. Rather, they would uh, change a lot of details in the novels. And then in order to fit into the uh, Shanghai society, at the time, so they would abridge them, reconfigure them, and then create really beautiful stories that are almost original creations in their own. Um, these novels were extremely popular in Shanghai and they were serialized in magazines. And at the same time, a lot of filmmakers loved to um, adapt them onto the screen. Now, <clears throat> We do need to mention a little bit of what was going on in this uh, in uh, Chinese politics at that time. In the film, A String of Pearls, you would notice that um, the film has a very interesting mix between anti-capitalism and anti-modernity. And so some viewers would easily fall into the trap of thinking that, oh, it must be a kind of socialist film. As a matter of fact, it wasn't socialism at all. It was a very interesting 1920s mixture that was that really emerged in China, uh, in Chinese politics at that time. And that kind of mixture was um, proposed by uh, a thinker called Chen Gongbo in the 1920s. For him, neither Marxism nor capitalism could liberate China from imperialism and establish its political community as a nation. So instead he synthesizes the two systems by proposing the nation as a giant production machine. Each individual for Chen Gongbo is a component in this machine called a Guomin or national. So for Chen Gongbo, the state should take care of every aspect of an individual's biological life in order to maximize production and productivity. So um, the idea at the time was really interesting. And um, as a matter of fact, it was widely adapted by many nationalist officials 
in the 1920s and into the 1930s. For example, Chen Mifu, um, who was the head of the cinema um, department, and he says that the cinema should be mobilized as a tool to instill a common sense of life into individual bodies. And eventually the, um, um, the, eventually the chief commander, because at that time, um, the presidency was turned into a kind of military chief commander, uh, Chiang Kai-shek, um, wrote out a program called the New Life Movement. And the New Life Movement was actually based on Protestantism, Protestantism, uh, but it was packaged in the framework of Confucianism. So for him, the idea is that if um, every national, if every biopolitical life treats each other with rituals, meaning with politeness, with courtesy, and uh, so that they could fulfill uh, their mutual responsibilities to each other, and also practice frugality so that uh, more wealth could be uh, invested into the nation building project and also know how to become shameful if, if they become wasteful. Then for him, he's, he literally says the DNA, like the, the, the cells of the nation would be instilled into every single body. Now, as I said, this idea was really interesting in the 1920s, and it was associated with the Nationalist Party. Uh, nowadays, of course, we know that we could consider it as a kind of proto-fascism uh, in, in, in that sense. And um, as a matter of fact, Chiang Kai-shek would consider himself much closer to fascist Italy and Nazi Germany in the 19. 20s and 1930s, um, only that later on, because of the uh, international war situation, um, um, he, he and, of course, Madame Chiang Kai-shek um, later on would propose to join the Allies instead. Um, and so, as I said, um, I would just say really briefly that in on September the 18th, 1931, the Japanese Guangdong Army occupied Manchuria. And then on um, the 28th of January, 1932, the Japanese military invaded Shanghai. So that was really the beginning of um, the turn of Shanghai film criticism and theory from the kind of more nationalist preoccupation into Marxism. And of course, in the 1930s, Marxism was not the only dominant uh, mode of criticism. It was there was still a strong debate between uh, more capitalist oriented um, film aesthetics and obviously the more hardcore uh, Marxist film criticism. Now, <clears throat> um, let me go into the film itself, and 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 I would like to kind of um, say a few pointers regarding what to uh, take note uh, when we are watching this film. This is a really truly beautiful film. And as I said, Li Ziyuan uh, was um, in New York City. And so nowadays we would say that he should be considered um, Chinese American. And so in the film, you would see that a lot of mise-en-scene or production design uh, are very much embracing the kind of middle-class American values. And he, you can also say that he conveys a kind of middle-class American values, not only by his production design, and you, as you can see from this slide, you, you could almost see a, an Americanized townhouse um, with a fireplace, with a, an armchair and a sofa, like beautiful European paintings, um, but also um, he conveys that kind of value by using D.W. Griffith's mode of editing. Now, D.W. Griffith's mode of editing at that time, um, we're talking about the 1925, and it is close enough to Hollywood um, editing, but there are still some differences. So we can definitely see that, uh, for example, in the beginning, uh, you can see a shot, this particular shot, a long shot of the living room, 
And then it cuts to a three quarter shot of the same couple reading. And then in order to emphasize the intimacy and mutual relationship, they, uh, the film cuts to a medium close up of the husband looking at the wife and then you, you, you see a kind of response, a kind of reaction of the wife. And so this is a very kind of typical way of sequencing a series of shots by D.W. Griffith and by a lot of American filmmakers at the time. And, but as I said, um, it is a little bit different from classical Hollywood editing, which we would obviously uh, relate to um, later classical Hollywood filmmakers like Cecil B. DeMille and, um, and, and, and definitely other great American filmmakers in the 1930s. And so, for example, you can see that um, there is a tendency for, um, for uh, Li Ziyuan to use descended framing. So it's a very interesting way of framing. Um, the main action in this particular case doesn't Folk doesn't actually take place in the middle of the frame, as you can see. The human figures are put, are put in the background and also a little bit um, descended toward the left. Now, it has two functions, and I'm going to tell you um, a more practical function first. The practical function is that um, at that time, the filmmakers in America and also in China, they were still kind of figuring out how to create continuity. So you can see that they're cutting directly in like from the long shot into the medium close up or the medium shots in this case, um, by directly just moving the camera a little bit closer. Now, um, by the 1930s, a lot of Hollywood film filmmakers would, would usually try to, to move the camera a little bit um, away uh, for at least 30 to 45 degrees. Um, so in order that we won't uh, create a jump cut. But as you can see, by decentering the long shot, the action of long shot on the side, we won't notice the, the jump. Um, so the cut becomes really smooth as a result of that. Now, another, another um, reason why the framing is decentered is also because um, a lot of intellectuals at that time were fascinated with uh, medieval Chinese aesthetics. And so one technique in medieval Chinese aesthetics was the idea of decentering the frame so that we can appreciate the general environment as a unified whole. So our eyes are not supposed to be simply focusing on the human beings, but our eyes are supposed to be wandering around the screen, almost in navigating or, or embarking on a journey so that we can appreciate the beauty and also the energy of the entire environment. And so this is a really uh, a particular kind of aesthetics that they inherited from medieval China. And because of this interest in emphasizing the environment as a whole, the filmmaker um, Li Ziyuan is also very interested in depth of field framing. So again, in this particular scene, uh, which takes place uh, pretty early on in the film, you can see that there are literally three layers, the foreground, middle ground, and the background. And the foreground, in the foreground, you see the grandmother and the child and the children on the left. In the middle ground, we actually see uh, a number of women uh, who are discussing the string of pearls um, on our protagonist's body. Um, they, it's so this is a really important part of the drama. Um, but then at the same time, our eyes are also drawn to the background where we see a bunch of people socializing in another room. And so um, in this entire shot, you would notice that um, all three spots, the, the foreground, middle ground, and the background are all very busy. Uh, but at the same time, because the main action is still in the middle ground, um, this filmmaker is still able to keep our attention on the actual um, 
on the actual action itself. So, of course, in the same scene, the film will cut into a three-quarter shot of um, these of the two women and um, a man who will play a very important role in the film. But even in this particular shot, you can see the background um, being quite busy. And so another very important um, point to point out is that, as I said, Li Ziyuan and Hou Yao are very interested in presenting the image of China, uh, not simply as an exotic and um, orientalist um, kind of kingdom, but they really want to present the way uh, Chinese architecture and basically how people live, lived in the 1920s. And so um, they featured a lot of semi-colonial uh, Shanghai architecture. So we should never uh, forget that Shanghai at that time was partially occupied by France and also by um, the UK and the uh, and the United States of America, and um, <clears throat> and also they featured um, uh, interior design. So these um, semi-colonial designs usually would mix features of Europe, European design. So we can see that this mansion has many European features, like columns and the doors and things like that. But at the same time, uh, it has uh, some um, Chinese-styled screens um, at the back of the, of the portico or at the back of the vestibule. And meanwhile, in the in the living room of the main protagonist, you're seeing the same thing. It's a fairly European styled room. It's almost like a, a Griffith film, but at the same time, you're seeing some um, Chinese design in in uh, as part of the daily uh, living um, of the Shanghai uh, upper class. And so again, this is another example of uh, the couple sitting in a very European styled uh, sofa in front of a very Euro-American styled fireplace. And at the same time behind them, you would see more like um, Chinese designed uh, with the flower ports and also the screen. Um, another very interesting thing, which is uh, very D.W. Griffith as well, is the emphasis on technological mediation, um, not only of language, but also of emotion. So there's a really beautiful scene in which you could see the wife is talking, uh, basically almost saying farewell to each other um, when the husband is about to be arrested. And so you can see that uh, the whole film by that time emphasizes how their emotions are being exchanged technologically by the telephone. Um, <clears throat> and the other, uh, another thing that is also very interesting in the film is that it uses another kind of medieval uh, Chinese aesthetics called obstacle or gu. And so in this particular, in, in European aesthetics, we sometimes would call it frame within frame. And so the idea is that um, in the prison visit, um, we would see that the entire scene takes place um, <clears throat> in a uh, within frames, within doors and windows that are not necessarily realistic. They're actually very beautiful. Um, so they, they're not necessarily really conveying the prison, but they, they almost... Uh, you almost feel like you are engaging in the obstacles, in seeing them and engaging in them through obstacles that are aesthetically designed. And you can see again in this scene, the wife and the husband are being separated by the police um, in very stylized uh, door frames. And, um, and the idea is that uh, Li Ziyuan also likes using... Um, symbolic and poetic montage. So, for example, by the last uh, half an hour of the film, uh, we would see that the wife in the film um, she loses all the money, so she 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 helps um, other villages to actually uh, mend clothes and um, and to also sometimes make some new clothes as well. And this is being intercut with a husband um, being in prison learning how to weave um, a piece of cloth, which is a very important skill that he would be able to use. And so the idea is that um, in this particular montage, it's a very long montage. And so when you're seeing that particular montage, um, bear in mind that um, the filmmaker has music in mind. So the idea is that 
The montage wasn't supposed to be seen without any accompaniment. Um, and at the same time, the two shots, the two environments, the factory, the prison and, um, and the wife's home are also intersected uh, or interposed with intertitles that would convey the kind of feelings through poetry. And, um, and also in that part, in this particular, in the, in, in the last segment of the film, um, or toward the last segment of the film, um, the uh, film also uses flashback, not only as a way to um, tell us something about the protagonist's memories, but also as a kind of poetic reflection of um, what it means by being human. So for example, you can see that the protagonist has been released from prison and he has a flashback and he, of course, no one, no relative of his wants to talk to him. And so um, eventually he has a flashback uh, to the moment before he got into prison and he remembered the time when he was rich. And so he realized that human beings are like this. Um, this is the way it is for human beings, that when you're rich, everyone wants to hang out with you, want to help you uh, when you don't need any help. But when you really do need some help because you're poor, you're uh, decrepit, somehow no one wants to care about you anymore. Um, the film, Really, uh, this is also a very interesting beginning in Shanghai cinema where they plays with a trope, a kind of metaphor, uh, which surrounds city versus country. So the city is usually being identified with modernity, capitalism, and the kind of uh, ills and evil, if you want to use those words, uh, associated with capitalist pleasure and desire for money, and then the country, which is usually associated with purity. And this kind of association sometimes is very also very common in Weimar cinema at the same time. And um, <clears throat> it's very interesting that the film eventually um, talks about how the protagonist joins the textile industry. The textile industry was huge in Shanghai at that time. And um, so uh, the textile industry was mostly privately owned at the time, but the nationalist government did have the ambition to nationalize it because it was so um, prosperous. And so on the right-hand side, you would see that there's a column on which... Um, the idea uh, there is uh, there are four Chinese characters on the right, and these four Chinese characters are really trying to tell people that the tech, what the textile industry can bring about, is a kind of world peace. The ideas of nation building and also world peace. Um, so this is almost like something that um, a lot of audience may look at it and pass unnoticed. Um, and um, and um, in addition to that, I would also say that um, um, the in the film is also very interesting. The idea is that uh, Li Ziyuan is very fascinated with womanhood, especially modern womanhood in Shanghai and also under semi-colonialism and capitalism. But it's very interesting that this film features a key word which is vanity. Um, it's kind of disturbing, in my opinion, that um, in the film, um, the, the men actually experience a lot of downfall. Um, the men are actually behaving very badly, but somehow the women somehow are to blame um, for these men's misbehavior and also these men's um, misconduct. And the film kind of traces all of these problems to women's vanity. And so in some ways, um, it is disturbing from our perspective, of course, uh, in terms of representation of women. Um, and at the same time, we can also associate this kind of um, view on women's, what it means by being a modern woman um, with the more general um, problems among Shanghai people and among a lot of urban people around the world in Shanghai, in Tokyo, or in, in, in Weimar, Germany. 
to think about what it means by modernity and what kinds of problems human beings face. Um, but very unfortunately, in this film, um, they all kind of land on uh, women as the kind of ultimate source of responsibility. And eventually, I think it's really important to emphasize that the film um, promotes uh, the fact that um, the problems with capitalism could be uh, resolved through class reconciliation and also the re restoration and, um, and reestablishment of Protestantism and Confucianism. So this is pretty much like the, the ending shot of the film. And you can see that the film uses the kind of new theater framing or almost like a proscenium to give us a very idealized picture of a Protestant slash Confucian family. And so, so again, to go back to the kind of political reference, um, it was very much in tune with nationalism at the time. And again, nowadays we could almost associate it with a kind of proto-fascism. Um, um, but <clears throat> the idea is that um, this film is very enjoyable um, as a piece of historical um, and archival um, and also aesthetic and uh, as a piece of art. Um, so, um, but, and the idea is that, of course, we need to bear in mind some of the political problems or representational problems, uh, but it's a really fascinating film and, ex and, ex and also an extremely well-crafted film. So I hope that you will enjoy the film and um, I can't wait to hear some of your feedback and um, thank you very much. Wow, wow. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Victor Fan. It was really fascinating and you packed such a lot in and I feel like you've really given us this great road into how to understand and enjoy the film and so many things that we would definitely otherwise have missed. And I, I love the way you draw out about the, you know, the context of the Chinese film industry and how that sits in a much wider international industry and the way you're inviting us to consider the themes and politics and society and the archival interests, like you say, loads of pointers. Of, um, I lo also really fascinating to hear about the influence of D.W. Griffith. And I'm delighted that we're actually showing an extract from the D.W. Griffith version of the same Maupassant story, The Necklace. I was showing a clip of that before we show uh, the, the feature String of Pearls, and that was made in 1909, The Necklace. And, and we're showing City Girl, so Mo now, and the, where we're, as you raise the, the whole thing around um, city versus the countryside. And I think it's just, so, you've given us such richness um, in your talk, and I really thank you for that. Um, so the, the feature film is screening at HipFest on Sunday the 20th of March at 3.30 at the Hippodrome with live music by John Sweeney on piano and details of this and the rest of the programme are at uh, our website hipfest.co.uk and we're really looking forward to seeing you in real life at the cinema if it's possible for you to attend. And um, our next online event as well, same time next week with musicians discussing composing for the Movie World Tour programme. I'd like to thank also um, our BSL interpreter, Greg, and thanks to Christina Weber for HipFest, who's been really busy behind the scenes, making everything run smoothly and generating the captions. Thanks again to the Confucius Institute and to you for watching. We do hope you enjoyed it. Um, I should say this is a free talk and um, uh, if you have the means and you'd like to support us, there are a number of ways you can donate or pay it forward. All the details for that are on our website too. Uh, but for now, goodbye and have a good evening. Thanks very much. Thank you.